how to strength train safely and effectively as you age. In this episode, you're going to learn about how strength training for looks different differs from strength training for longevity. You'll learn about some of the most undertrained muscle groups that you need to be training in order to prevent injury and much more. interview Austin Current. Austin is a former bodybuilding professional who now focuses on strength training for longevity rather than just looks, although of course there's overlap. Today you're going to learn about how to strength train safely, how to manage soreness, how you should time your macronutrients before and after workouts, and more. So let's go ahead and dive in. It's time to get closer and closer to your best you with Austin Current. All right, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to the Best You Podcast. Today, I'm super excited to be joined by Austin Current, and Austin is an expert basically on the science of strength training, and so, Austin, I just really want to dive right into some of the nuances and some of the practical things that people can do to optimize their strength training, both for the strength benefits, the muscle, like building muscle benefits, the longevity benefits, and all the stuff like that, so I want to get... uh, kind of practical with you right away. I think that getting proper range of motion with certain exercises is super important, but it's often not done by a lot of people who are doing strength training. And so I want you to talk to the importance of kind of like mobility and range of motion when it comes to strength training and the importance of it. Like, is it really that important to make sure we can always get full range of motion and maybe sacrifice some weight or is it okay to sometimes go heavier but not quite get full range of motion kind of harp on the idea around mobility range of motion and strength training and when it's important and when it's not as important when when thinking about mobility and range of motion we have to think about two things that inevitably lead someone later in life to lose their independence and that tends to be both mobility and strength, right? So they, and it, the the root cause is, tends to be injury of some kind. And so, you know, as you, let's, let's say you're, you know, listen to this, you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, kind of imagine yourself in your sixth, seventh, eighth decade of life and you, or just imagine one of your grandparents, or maybe you have experienced this with maybe one of your parents or grandparents recently, but you know, they get injured. They were otherwise very healthy uh, or reasonably healthy. They get injured. They are on bed rest or can't move very well. They lose a lot of not only strength, but range of motion. Um, and then because they didn't have much strength or, or they, they, because after the injury, they don't have much strength. They don't, they also haven't moved much. They don't have much range of motion. Those things also play into each other they're, those those two are related, and those those two are interrelated. Is, is generally what I'm trying to say. And so, as we lose range, we tend to lose strength because we just can't move through a certain range. And then, as we lose strength through a range, we end up losing more range through that. You know, it's it's sort of this never ending cycle. And so, I find even through a lens of working on building. So, if we kind of come back to today's world, if you're imagining yourself in the future. If we come back, transport ourselves back into today and the present, if you're working and trying to build muscle and strength, I find it increasingly important to spend the majority of your time going through a full range of motion, building strength through a full range of motion, but also training muscle tissue and connective tissues through a full range of motion. Because again, you have to think about what's your everyday life look like? Your everyday life isn't this extremely structured move. They are, it, it's not filled with these very structured movement patterns. It's filled with a lot of random movement patterns, picking stuff up in a random way, maybe picking up your your kids, which resembles probably something more like a Zercher squat than anything, right? Um, and I don't do a ton of Zercher squats, but it, you know, if, I'm, if you're reasonably like picking up a kid or, or moving boxes or something, like you're doing these kind of these full range of motion, large range of motion movement patterns, and you need strength within those unorthodox ranges in a lot of, a lot of ways throughout your daily life. And so with that in mind, you know, I, I know depending on kind of where your audience, uh, tends to take an information through the internet, 
there's been a lot of conversation over, you know, do we need range of motion? Is it, do we just need partial reps? Do we just need these smaller ranges of motion through a part of the rep that's, that's the heaviest or most challenging. And, you know, even some of the, there's enough research at this point to say that that's a beneficial thing to do is to, to work through partial ranges of motion and, and really exhaust muscles that way. And, and it's a good way to stimulate the muscle growth process. But if we kind of zoom out and have a more of a longevity health span lens, you got to also think about the orthopedic nature to everyday life. And I, that's kind of where you can't, you can't talk me out of the, the benefit of working a muscle, working a joint, working connective tissue through a full range of motion, maintaining strength at different joint angles, um, and everything that's involved there. And so one of the biggest things, again, as you age, I'll kind of just end with this is, you know, you can watch uh, people that are, are later in life, elderly folks who are around you, they start again, they start to lose that mobility. They can't bend over as far. And then if they can, they've lost all the strength there. So they can't quite pick anything up or they can't, they start to shuffle or they start to move in this way. They can't get off the couch. They can't get in the car. There's all these things where it's, these are preventable outside of something happening or some autoimmune disorder or neurodegenerative disorder. These are preventable things that we can, we have full control over earlier on in our life. And it's, it's up to us to kind of put ourselves through that challenge and to prepare ourselves for the opportunity to live later in life in a healthy way. Yeah. I love how you talk about strength training, especially your personal focus has become more longevity based than necessarily figure based, if you will. Now, I'm sure there's still some figure base to it, right? Like we all kind of want to look a certain way. Everybody listening wants to look a certain way, but a lot, honestly, most people are listening, aren't looking to be bodybuilders or anything like that. They want the longevity benefits that strength training provides. So over the years, what has changed from your strength training routines that lend themselves more towards like longevity benefits compared to when you are maybe more towards figure benefits and performance benefits? Yeah. Um, so I, I've had a, I had a professional career in bodybuilding. I was a professional physique uh, bodybuilder in the IFBB uh, early as a youngin. Um, seems like a lifetime ago. Uh, that was, that was in my, I turned pro when I was 20. And so that was my early twenties were spent doing that. Right. So my, my sole focus of training was purely on the aesthetic, purely on how I not only look day to day, but how I present myself in over the next six months on this one day at this one time. Right. And so everything was leading into those moments and preparing myself for, to look the absolute best at all times. And so now it's, it's more about understanding again, like the benefits of strength training and the benefits of this, these, uh, these modalities of physical activity are only rewarded if we are able to continue to do them throughout our life, mm. right? It doesn't matter that you lift it every day. If you're in your forties, it doesn't matter. You're obviously in a better position if you didn't than if you didn't, but it, it matters less that you trained, you know, a ton when you're 20 to 25, but now you're 45 and you've lost all that muscle. You've lost all that strength. You know, it's not a moot point. It's not that that didn't count for, you know, that's, that was all for nothing, but in a big way, it was kind of, you're not benefiting. You're not reaping the benefits of that any longer. Like it's something that you have to stay consistent with. And so I've taken an approach more recently after kind of hanging up the, the board shorts, if you will, um, after hanging up the, the bodybuilding career, it's really been focused on consistency and adherence to things that again, put me through full ranges of motion, help me maintain strength, help me maintain enough of what I need aesthetically to, to have this self-confidence that, you know, I, I my self-confidence, I've, I've learned this as I've gotten older, because I went through a period of after, I think a lot of people after they stop bodybuilding or, or doing something like that, you tend to kind of like, you're at one extreme and you tend to, to, go towards the other extreme. And you, you know, I went through months and months without training and all of that stuff. And I, I learned that, oh, 
I need this to feel like myself. I need this to feel good. I need this to actually not be in pain. And because as soon as I stopped training, I lost muscle, I lost strength, I lost mobility. I found that I was actually in more pain. You know, it wasn't muscular. It wasn't aches and pains, muscular soreness from training anymore. It was like true injury feeling type of stuff around my body. And I was like, wow, this isn't good at all. You know, and so uh, the big part of kind of how I transitioned more towards, towards a longevity approach is having a, a mantra of live to train another day. Um, I like to push myself, but if there's ever a question of, Ooh, is, is this worth, is the juice worth the squeeze on this last set? Or should I take this last set to failure? Like it's prescribed. I'm not nice. I'm not actually feeling it today. It's just, it's being honest with myself and allowing myself those, those moments of, ah, I just live to train another day. It's not worth it. Um, and that isn't to say that I, I want to allow weeks of weeks and months of months of, to pass and having those excuses in my creep up in my head, because I also want to, I also want to show up in the way that I want to show up and I want to keep the promises that I've made to myself. And if I've written it down, if I've programmed it for myself in that way, I know I'm capable of doing it, but there are those days, there's some weeks that go by that are just, ah, no, I'm, I've got in here. I did 80% of this. I feel good about that. That's great. That's going to keep me where I want to be. And again, live to train another day. Yeah. I, I love how you talk about how you want to train like for yes, the current version of yourself, but you want to train for the future version of yourself, right? Like if you train a lot between 25 and 30 years old, but then you get to 45 and you hadn't trained in the last five years and you don't look and feel a certain way, then like, what's the good of training really hard 20 at between 25 and 30? It's like, <clears throat> you want to train for all versions of yourself, the version that you are today, but also the version that you are in the future. And like you said, it's not a matter of necessarily not challenging yourself but it's a matter of not putting your like self on the line where you're leaving yourself up to injury regular on a regular basis right like you're probably a pretty competitive dude i'm a pretty competitive dude like I, there are times when i put want to push it and like see what i can do but i don't want to do that at the expense of like screwing over my future self where i'm gonna have to take a decent amount of time off because i'm injured or like my joints are off and stuff like that so i think training like the idea of yes, training for your performance today, but also the future version of yourself is, is critical. So how do you kind of currently mix up your training regimen over time? Like, do you kind of go th do any kind of like phases of like, I'm working on this right now. And then after that, I'm going to be working on this or what, what does your kind of regimen look like with kind of like periodization or mixing things up over time? Yeah. It used to be, a, it used to be extremely structured as you'd imagine. Right. Uh, I used to have a very phasic approach to, throughout the year based off my competing seasons and off seasons and stuff, or even throughout my childhood through athletics, you know, you're either in season or off season. So it used to be very, very strict ultimately. And now it, it it's migrated to be more based off of feel for me. And so it, it tends to be, it t does tend to be more seasonal in my interest because, you know, I, I live out in Denver, Colorado, and like right now it's 20 degrees and extremely windy outside. It's not very pleasurable to like go out and run or be outside and do different things outside. And the sun goes down at 4 PM. So it's like, I'm not that motivated to get out there and like, or have a ton of time, but in the summers it's beautiful out here and the sun, sun sets at like 9 PM. And so there's a lot more opportunities to get out, trail run, make that more part of our day-to-day -day or go swim or uh, cycle or something like that. And it's it's a lot more, it's a lot easier in those seasons to get out and do that. To whereas the winter, I tend to focus more on more or less building up my muscle and strength for what those other seasons, right? So I kind of use the winters to, you know, not necessarily bulk from a physical standpoint, but I do tend to, I have to, so I have to, I've learned that I have to physically wear myself out to, to be able to manage my stress properly internally, externally, but also, uh, to sleep well. And I tend to struggle a lot with sleep if I don't move a lot. And I think that's where a lot of our sleep is, issues as a culture comes from is just our very sedentary life, uh, filled with, you know, staring at screens and, and not moving very much. Um, I would credit more to it, not moving much more so than screens, but. 
I'm sure they do and have an interplay in, into one another, but I've learned that about myself. And so also a lot of my training now is how can I physically wear my, is, is based around how can I physically wear myself out every day? And if I don't do that, then I tend to get more anxious. I tend to not sleep well. I tend to, my mood tends to be a little bit more erratic, not quite as stable. And I've just started to learn these things about myself. And it's been extremely helpful to be able to kind of deploy what I need most from my training. Again, having training be more of a complement to my life rather than my whole life. You know, when I was competing in, in sports, like, you know, two sessions a day weren't that odd for me. Like that was a normal thing. Six, you know, two sessions a day, five or six days a week. One session maybe weights, the other maybe some type of aerobic or sprints, or maybe two weight sessions that day. That was most my life leading into my until I was about 24 years old. And then now it's just man, if I, uh, my goal is to, to try and physically wear myself out in one way or another every day, whether that's getting a certain threshold of steps or movement each day versus trying to get in some, you know, four or five, three, four or five training sessions in a week, depending on kind of what I'm doing. But yeah, to kind of like more specifically, I guess the answer to that is it does become more seasonal and based off of preference. And I found myself seasonally more interested when it's summer, I want to be outside. So I want to do more stuff out there. It, it makes my uh, it makes me happier. My wife enjoys doing that a lot more than uh, we like. To, we enjoy doing that together more or less. Um, and so that becomes something we do together. And and so that feeds into my relationships, were, which are important to me. And so if I can kind of, you know, two birds with one stone thing, that's great. Uh, but in the winter, yeah, I, I tend to focus a little bit more on on gaining muscle and strength to kind of prepare me for the season of the summer where I'm not training quite as much. And so I'm more or less focused on maintaining what I did in the built in the winter to kind of lead me through the year. Yeah. I think that's important for everybody to realize that there could be, and kind of should be a seasonality to your training based off of what you enjoy, based off of the weather that's going on, based off of who you might be around or want to be around and stuff like that. Like I'm the same way when it's, warmer outside, I might be going on runs more often. Um, and during certain seasons, like I might be going to a certain fitness class with my fiance more so than another. Like there's just going to be, I think so many times people get stuck in like one definition of success with their fitness routine and they don't learn how to make it seasonal and be fluid and stuff like that. So it's, it's important to be able to, to let that stuff adapt as you go throughout your year. And obviously as you go throughout your life, um, I'm curious from, and anatomy standpoint, what do you find are some of the most um, frequently like undertrained muscle groups or the frequently just like neglected types of training that people are doing that are leading them to more injury as they get older? And what are some of the things that we need to be training from a modality and a muscle group standpoint to make sure that we can prevent injury as we get older? Yeah, I, I think from that perspective, I, you know, it's think about muscles that just don't get quite as involved or they are involved, but not quite as involved in kind of the movement patterns that you put yourself through. Uh, think like hinging patterns, squat patterns, uh, pressing patterns, pulling patterns, things like that. Kind of those main movement patterns that you'd be doing when you press or row or squat or uh, deadlift or something like that. So things like your, your abductors, your abductors, um, the smaller glute muscles around the hip, your adductors, your adductors, um, which are just the muscles that are in the internal part of your, your upper leg, um, that help pull your, your leg more medial, medial towards, towards the midline, towards kind of the center of your body. Um, and so a lot of those trying to move in different planes, uh, under resistance, under load is, is a great way to to train those tissues. Um, because I, I mean, we spend a ton of time in the sagittal plane, right? Think about the sagittal plane is the plane you're in when you walk, right? It's, it's, everything's forward. We don't quite do much, especially in normal strength training. Uh, it's, you know, depending on if you've been in it for a while, uh, or if you're just getting into it, we tend, most things are programmed kind of in, within that sagittal plane. And so it's trying to get in the, uh, these other planes of motion, you know, you don't have to, I don't really subscribe to you know, looking at different planes of motion and programming specific to that. But I, I do think about moving through different planes of motion, whether that's in my strength training or it's being sure that I'm doing things outside of training 
that help facilitate that, like trail running or playing basketball or whatever that is. I'm trying to have more movement freedom when I can within that training, uh, because usually in the gym, I do spend more time within that sagittal plane, kind of that one plane of motion. Um, but I've definitely added a lot more rotational stuff to my training as of late. Um, I've added a lot more, uh, again, AB doctor kind of think about those outs muscles on the outside of the hip versus the inside of the, the hip and the uh, upper leg. Um, and so I'd say those are, those are a big thing. And then abs core, uh, I think people tend to one, they're not, you know, you're either super into training your core or you're not. Uh, there's not really a middle ground I, I've, I've found. Um, I either have clients begging me for it or clients telling me that they absolutely don't want to do it ever. Please don't make me do this. Uh, so, you know, it's you usually don't live in the middle there. But I, I think having a, a balanced relationship with with training your core, again, through different planes of motion, uh, both from a actively, think about actively rotating under load versus uh, resisting rotation under load are two very important aspects of that core. Uh, and I, I believe that core extends, you know, that's, that's your spinal erectors, that's your low back, your mid back, that's everything that would involve having a stable core of someone, you know, if you're in a position where you're like, that person has a strong core versus they don't, you kind of know, generally it's, it's most of your torso and leading into your hips that your core is involved with. And so having just a strong foundation to be centered around, I think is extremely important. Um, and so it, it tends to be the muscles that, that I see neglected the most because they're, they're not included. You have to go out and, and kind of search for those movements more so than, than stumbling upon them. Right. Right. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Abductors, abductors, your adductors, your adductors, rotational stuff, core. I love it. Um, just kind of stick on this longevity strength training approach and such. I know that a lot of people, as they get older, 30s, 40s, 50s, and they continue to strength train, they might comment on the fact that they're not able to recover as quickly from training sessions or they're getting more sore from training sessions. What level of that, what amount of that is like okay versus how much is too much? And also on the same lines, how can we improve our recovery and make sure our recovery is as optimized as possible as we're getting older. So just this whole idea of soreness as we go, get older, how much is too much, how much is not enough, and then how do we optimize our recovery from our workouts? I think too much, you know, there's not necessarily that I've seen, whether it's through the research or just general accepted view, it's, there doesn't seem to be a, a strict line in the sand that we have drawn as an industry uh, or as research, you know, people doing research, I don't do research, but I try to make sense of it uh, and, and use it if I can. But as far as too sore, my my rule of thumb there is just if it impedes your next session, then you probably overdid it. Uh, so just take note of that. And that's the easiest way I can explain that um, or kind of like draw a, a tentative line in the sand, at least a dotted line in the sand that you should think about what, as you cross it. Um, you know, so if you have experienced a lot more soreness of like, oh, this is leading into my following sessions. That's probably too much, right? So you should probably pull back a little bit. Uh, but the also our physiology is really great at adapting to repeated exposures. So that's kind of why in a lot of, that's why in a lot of programs are really, you know, better programs than others. You tend to start at lower volumes, lower intensities and slowly or more slowly build yourself up. It doesn't have to be, you know, a snail speed, but you do start lower and get progressively higher, both in volume and intensity, typically. Um, and that, that could just be intensity of effort. That doesn't have to be intensity of load. Um, as you go through a phase of training or season of training, and that allows your body, your physiology to adapt uh, to that stressor. And each time you're re-exposed to that stress, your body's recognizes it more and more and, and doesn't get quite as sore. Um, and then secondly, I find that as you age, as you get older, I, I find that, you know, I, I find this more for men, but women definitely are not an exception here, but we tend to be very, we, we tend to romanticize barbell training a lot. And 
people tend to shy away from cables and machines when I don't think they should. I think cables and machines, I think we should use all tools equally in the gym. Um, all the, all, all we're looking at in a gym is, is a tool to place resistance in, to our body. Uh, and whether that's at a certain angle or a certain amount of variable resistance, that's all that's changing. You're again, your body, you probably heard this, but your body doesn't know what you're doing. It just, it understands loaded it understands resistance. It understands that it's being stressed from a certain angle at a certain magnitude for a certain duration. That's really all that it, it comprehends as far as I know. And as far as I've been able to understand as far as we know, as a, as an industry. And so, you know, that may change. I don't know. We may figure out that cats and dogs are also having full conversations. I have no clue. Right. But until we figure that out, our body doesn't really recognize what type of implement you're using. It just understands that resistance. Right. So use the tools available. And I find that cables and machines tend to be a lot more adaptable to people's structures than barbells do. And that makes sense, right? A barbell is just a solid straight piece of steel and cables and machines can be adjusted based off your structure. So off the bat, that makes more sense if you think about that. Um, and so you'll see, a, you see a lot of information, a lot of articles, a lot of opinions over, you know, are machines better than cables? Are they better than free weights? Are they better than this? And it's just do all of it. Just use what makes sense. So if you have cranky elbows, well, you probably shouldn't be doing barbell curls. You should probably use cable curls because you can adjust cables to your joint angle based off your arm path. And you go from having maybe more stress than is otherwise needed through a barbell curl to little to no stress at all through your elbow with a cable curl. The goal there is to challenge the connective tissue, the goal there is to challenge the joint, there's to challenge the tissue, the muscle tissue. So to me, that checks all the boxes of, well, that makes sense. Great. And you don't feel injured afterwards. You don't feel achy. You can train consistently like that. It's like, yeah, well then great. That's all I'm trying to do. And so I think we romanticize these things. And I, I find as we age, we, we tend to, uh, romanticize barbells uh, a lot and then we otherwise should, that isn't to demonize anything. I'm not discounting anything. Um, you know, you, you see 80 year olds deadlifting hundreds of pounds. I mean, that's great. Obviously we can still use barbells, but, um, we're not all built the same. We're not all, uh, our structures are different and cables and machines have literally been designed to help facilitate that better, uh, than a, a straight piece of steel. So, Again, don't over romanticize one over the other and just use them all. And is there a particular way where our body or things we can do? Maybe that's from uh, stretching, mobility, or nutrition to decrease the level of soreness or fatigue or, or in, improve our level of recovery following like a training session as we get older? Yeah. So obviously, uh, so basically the, we have volume, we have load management, right? Which load management kind of encapsulates uh, the volume and intensity. So starting at a lower volume and intensity, it also encapsulates kind of exercises that we're using. The That's also load management in many ways. Um, and that's why I kind of went off on that little tangent. Um, hopefully it was productive. But as far as nutrition and sleep and everything like that, yeah, I mean, that's probably, I mean, you got to think of, again, there's these old adages that are these old cliches that are, true uh that's why they're around but we training tears down our body nutrition and sleep helps build it back up so we cannot have one without the other and so having high quality nutrition trying to focus on whole foods uh the best you can not trying outside of a health reason not trying to omit or get rid of any major macronutrient um you know obviously having protein but prioritizing a well balance between carbs and fats, high quality fats, if you can. Um, and yeah, wear yourself out to where you can sleep at night and you, you get good quality sleep. And, you know, more research is coming out about the, the detriments of even casual drinking throughout the evening. So if you are going to enjoy a glass of wine, I'm not against that. Just try to make that earlier in the evening rather than later. Um, uh, because, 
even one glass has shown to have a pretty big impact on sleep quality. It may help you get to sleep, but it's not going to help you stay asleep or get good quality sleep. And so again, I'm not telling you not to do that or not to enjoy a glass of wine, but the earlier in the evening you can have that, the better. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Uh, second to last question is going to be around like nutrient macronutrient timing when it comes to the workouts like when it comes to pre-workout what's your philosophy on macronutrient timing to kind of optimize not just performance but also just kind of like how you feel during the workout and then same thing what's your philosophy for post-workout macronutrient consumption is it important to get protein in a certain amount of time is it a pro is it important to get carbohydrates in in a certain amount of time kind of what's your philosophy with pre and, and post workout macronutrient consumption there's a scale and a continuum, like with anything. Yeah. And if you had asked me five years ago, even three years ago, I would have had a different answer. Um, it tends, it, it seems like the more research we have on these these topics, the more generalized they've gotten, which to me is actually a good thing. I think a lot of people, I think a lot of practitioners and a lot of people who are have been spent a lot of time being very strict and serious about their their weightlifting and their nutrition. We tend to get discouraged that there's all those efforts weren't actually worth it um, or necessary. Not that they weren't worth it, but they weren't ne absolutely necessary, as crucial as we once thought, right? So, you know, we used to think that as soon as you hit your last rep, you got to get that protein shake in or else most of the work you did is, is gone, right? And then years later, we're like, well, maybe, maybe you have an hour or two. And now it's like, well, as long as you're just getting in a daily amount of protein, you're probably fine, right? And so that's with pretty much everything. It just kind of extends out more and more generalized. Um, and the further you are away from an athletic endeavor, especially one that has increasing energy demands, like an aerobic sport or like think Ironman, think marathon, think long distance uh, or high energy expenditure sports, your, your general's fine. Um, so just again, well-balanced, um, in terms of pre and post-workout preference, uh, I think getting three or four protein meals or protein feedings in throughout the day is a great idea. Um, if you can get 20, 30, 40 grams of protein three or four times a day for most people, that's probably going to be more than enough to support their life and health. Um, and then trying to meet a threshold or a demand of, of carbohydrates and fats that make you feel good and also keep you feeling good, but also looking in the way that you want to look. So, um, I tend to put carbs around workout windows because that tends to be the, the main energy source that we use during most workouts we're going to be doing, uh, as everyday people in the gym or, or elsewhere doing runs or short distance things. Um, and then I tend to so most of my carbs tend to be around that workout window most of the time, If and sometimes some days that's not true or not the case, but um, I'd say that's the norm. And then the other meals tend to be a little bit higher in fat and protein um, for me. That's just, again, based off of preference. If I'm training early in the morning, I don't actually like a lot of food uh, in terms of preference. So, you know, that could be, I, I if I'm training earlier in the morning, I tend to focus my dinner the night before more on my kind of my quote unquote pre-workout, um, understanding that's not necessarily going to still be in my bloodstream, but I at least fill, I try to fill glycogen stores. I try to have carbohydrates in that dinner. Um, I try to set myself up for success in the morning. And then the morning could be as simple as a, a glass of whole milk and a banana. I mean, it's just, cause you get some proteins, you get some fats, you get some sugars and then the banana, you get some sugars as well. And so, but it's also not very filling. And so I can go down and, and just train at a high intensity without feeling lethargic and like I just ate a full meal and also my appetite isn't raging that early in the morning. So, but sometimes in the afternoon, I like to have a lot of food in me. So again, it, you, I'm sure this answer isn't specifically helpful, but hopefully it's more generally helpful on the nature of preference is huge and just try and get a good threshold of well-balanced meals in throughout the day, uh, the best you can. And honestly, you're going to be fine. Yeah, no. And I love the way you answered it. I, because I always preach that context and personalization is key to all things when it comes to nutrition and health and fitness and stuff because you know there's a lot of people who try to give you a blanket approach or a one-size-fits-all or this is the best way or this is the worst way and stuff and 
most of the, like 99.9% .9 of the time, there's no best or worst way or one size fits all approach. Like you said, if, if, uh, like generally speaking, if you get the right quality, right quality and amount of protein throughout the day, you're probably going to be good. And then like, if your goal is to do a Ironman, then of course you're going to be need to be dialed in a little bit more with your timing of nutrient macronutrient consumption. If, but if you're just like an everyday person who just is going to go get a lift in and then go throughout their day, then it's going to be not quite as important. But then again, generally speaking, if you have your carbs a little bit more, maybe before and after your workout, that might be a little bit more beneficial, but then it depends on the time of day because you want to feel good going into your workout. And so it's, it's, um, very much it depends, but I love some of the things you gave with regards to 20 to 40 grams of protein, maybe three or four times a day, maybe carbohydrates around it. If you work out in the morning, the whole milk banana thing, I love it. Um, so great stuff right there. I appreciate you providing all of that. Um, before I ask the last question, I want to make sure everybody can go learn more from you. You wrote a book called The Science of Strength Training, and I'm going to have that link in the show notes where people can go learn more about around the anatomy of the body and everything like that. Give us just a quick like couple of sentence of what people can primarily learn in the science of strength training, both your book and kind of the brand that you are building. I'm trying to make it a tr uh, kind of a trusted go-to source for strength training. So generally, you know, from the book, you're looking at uh, chapter one is all about kind of what's happening internally. So what's happening at a muscular level and nervous system level when you train and how our bodies adapt to that positively. Chapter two is all about putting that into action. So that's the sh how we put put that uh, into action more or less. So what makes those processes actually happen through movement? And I give chapter two is all about the movements. So it's the strength exercises uh, that are broken down per muscle group, uh, per section. And then you have like main, you have the main exercises for each muscle group. And then there's three or four variations for every main exercise in there that are displayed to show you what anatomy is working and how to set up for them and how to, how to perform them or how they should look at least. And then chapter three is, is all about, uh, preventing injury or how, how to do our best to prevent injury if we can, and, and how to really come back from it if it happens, because it's inevitably going to happen in some capacity. So really there's, there's advice in there of how to come back from certain injuries, um, depending on the joint. Uh, and then more generally in terms of maybe limiting range of motion, maybe uh, changing the modality at which you train it. Maybe this is where if you're used to using barbells, maybe we switch to a machine um, to help facilitate the recovery process. And then also if you're actually injured, please see a physiotherapist uh, to get that properly taken care of. Um, and then chapter four is, is the programs. So it, it, there's there's programs in there three, four, and five day programs in there for three separate goals, whether your goal is building muscle strength or more muscular endurance. There's three, four, and five day programs, both beginner and advanced in that book um, in chapter four. And so that's generally what you're going to learn from the book. Hopefully that makes sense. And more generally from the brand, uh, if you know, if you go visit the website here over the near future, um, I'm getting more, more and more articles written that kind of encapsulate or expand on those, those very topics. And so my goal is to kind of create this kind of this go-to resource for people that can be trusted as far as being human written and a, a very trustworthy source based off experience and education on all things strength training. And so that's hopefully what you get from that. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. That's great. Well, uh, awesome. Before I ask the last question, I just want to acknowledge you for making kind of the shift in your mind and your lifestyle from doing strength training from a bodybuilding standpoint to more of a longevity standpoint. Not that like there's anything wrong with bodybuilding, but like I think everybody goes through seasons of, in your, of life and need to transition their approach, transition their values and everything like that. And I feel like you've done a really good job of doing that and, and sharing with others how to do that as well. Because so many people, a lot of people listening, as we get, you know, late 20s, 30s, 40s, it's less and less about necessarily how you look usually it's always a component but it's more and more how you feel and, and, and how you age well so i appreciate you and, and your approach to it but last question is hypothetical one if there's only three healthy habits that you could do for the rest of your life for whatever reason you can only choose three what are those three healthy habits that you would decide to continue to do the rest of your life 
just so I get this right, or kind of on the, the right train of thought, what's one habit that generally kind of that you would say here, not to copy off yours, but more or less, I want to understand, like, is it walking? Yeah, I mean, is that you a could, habit? You could, I, I kind of let people always run with it however they want to. It could be like, you could say something as general as like strength training is one of mine. You could do, you could say like healthy eating, or you could be like prioritizing protein. You know, you can kind of take it however like specific or broad as you would like. Yeah. Oh, so general physical activity is a habit uh, that encompasses everything from strength training to walking every day to trail running, you name it, swimming, cycling, just general physical activity. Um, as we've seen in the research time and time again, and it's becoming more and more obvious, the more research we collect, or not we, but the industry as a whole, people actually doing research, uh, that general physical activity, consistent physical activity across a life, a lifespan drastically improves health span, which is the quality of life and your overall well being, both, both mentally and physically. So that's a non-negotiable for me, uh, because also preferences change across time. So I'm not going to pigeonhole myself into one. So I just, I want general physical activity to be there. Um, and then yeah, healthy nutrition. That's an easy one. Um, it's an easy one on the surface, but it's a hard one to necessarily implement day to day if you're not used to it. So, uh, take your, be slow with it. Um, give yourself some compassion around that. We all have different nutritional habits that have been ingrained in us from, from a young age. Um, whether you came from a household that really paid attention to it or didn't, um, just understand that it, it is your responsibility now. Uh, so take it, take the responsibility and own that and, start making better decisions if you haven't started yet. Uh, because again, think about if you have the opportunity to have a 80 year old version of yourself living in this world, because unfortunately we all don't have that luxury, but let's plan for it. Um, you're going to want to be sure that you've taken care of yourself, right? It's the same thing of you hope that you have some sort of structure of preparing for retirement or old, having money as you get older um, and can't work anymore. It's, it's the same thing with your health. Um, so we tend to get a lot of information around planning for the future as far as our financials go, but we don't tend to get the same information around where our health is at, right? So it's great to have money, but if you don't have a body to, to actually complement that, then who cares? Because um, all that money goes back to the government anyways. So <laughs> uh, and then the third thing is, is sleep. Yeah. Uh, and, and both of those play into the last one. So the first two play into the third. So, uh, the more I can wear myself out and, and nourish myself, uh, wear myself out through the physical activity and nourish myself through the, the good whole nutrition, the best I can, the better my sleep quality is and the better I'm able to show up day to day, um, and across my life. And hopefully the, through all of those habits, I'm able to stave off most, if not all the preventable diseases that inevitably creep up in, in a large majority of our population's life, unfortunately, that are preventable. So those are my three. Awesome. Awesome, man. I love it. Well, I know everybody learned a ton from a lot of different standpoints today about the importance of range of motion and functionality and mobility with our strength training, how the approach to strength training for kind of longevity might look a little bit different. Some of the most important exercises we should be doing to prevent injury, how to manage soreness, um, some meal timing and stuff like that. It was great. So you guys need to make sure you go follow Austin on Instagram at Austin current underscore. And then he also has a specific Instagram profile for his brand science of strength training, which is exactly that at science of strength training. So I'll have all that stuff linked up in the show notes, but Austin, that's all we got today, man. I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate having me on, man. Thank you. Of course. I thought that interview with Austin was great because of his perspective of strength training and exercise as it relates to longevity. If you want to regain the confidence that you once had with your health, if you want to be able to change how you look in the mirror and improve your habits, then join the next 10-week transformation starting January 22nd. At the time of releasing this episode, we are just one week away from the start of the next 10WT on January 22nd. For 10 weeks, I will hold you accountable to creating real lasting change so you can look the way you want to look and feel the way you want to feel. You can join in Nashville or the virtual group by going to nickcarrier.com slash 10WT. Again, today at nickcarrier.com slash 10WT. Some of my biggest takeaways from Austin during this interview were the following. It's okay and even recommended 
that your training regimen be seasonal. Sometimes strength train more, sometimes do more aerobic exercise outside. I would say always do both strength training and aerobic work, but you can change up the modality and the frequency depending on the season of the year and just the season of your life. Maintaining independence as you age starts with mobility and strength. So when you're training, make sure you do your exercises with their full range of motion. Be sure to prioritize undertrained muscle groups that are critical for safety and injury prevention like abductors, which is the outside part of your hip and glutes, your adductors, your inner thigh muscles, and do rotational and core work. Also, remember to train for all versions of you. Train for the current version of you, yes, so that you can look and feel the way that you want, but also keep in mind the future you and set them up for success. You'll be happy you did. Training for all versions of you will help you to continue to get closer and closer to your best you.